Well, we are continuing our series tonight in the book of Amos. This is part two of a four-part series, so welcome back to our series in Amos. And if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to go ahead and turn to the book of Amos. It is the third of the 12 prophets, as Tom mentioned, often called the minor prophets, but nothing about them or their message is minor. They're simply called that because they are shorter, more concise books as compared to prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel. This is the third of the 12 prophets. If you can't find it, just go to Matthew and turn nine books to your left and you'll be there. As we mentioned last week, Amos ministered in the middle of the 8th century BC, some 750 years before the birth of Christ. This was during the period of what's called the divided kingdom in Israel's history. He was a contemporary of other well-known prophets, such as Jonah and Hosea and Isaiah. And though he was born in the southern kingdom, Amos was called by God to minister primarily to the northern kingdom, the 10 tribes of Israel. He was not formally trained as a prophet, but instead was a shepherd and a farmer whom God raised up to offer this stern rebuke to his chosen nation. The book of Amos is nine chapters long. It's 146 verses to be precise, and its content is primarily filled with a message of judgment from the Lord who roars against the hypocrisy of a people who were very religious, but were neither righteous nor repentant. And last week, we looked at the first three chapters of this book, and as we did, we noted three characteristics of the message of judgment that we find here in the book of Amos. And if you were here, you'll remember that we saw in chapter one the foil for God's message of judgment, and that foil came in the form of the surrounding nations upon whom judgment would also fall, but if they were guilty before God, how much more so his own chosen nation when they had rejected the very law of God. We saw secondly the focus of God's message of judgment there in the middle of chapter two, which focused on the fact that Israel was living in wickedness. They were characterized by corrupt actions and also by insincere and hypocritical worship. And then thirdly, we saw the force of God's message of judgment there at the end of chapter two into chapter three. And we noted that it was inescapable and inevitable and that God's judgment would be intense. This evening then, as we continue into the book of Amos, we will add a fourth aspect to that outline And that is what I'm calling the features of God's message of judgment, mainly in chapters four, five, and six, though we will go back and revisit just a few verses at the end of chapter three, the features of God's message of judgment. And in total tonight, we will cover 59 verses, which I know is a lot, but we'll be moving very quickly As we look at this oracle of judgment which Amos delivered against the northern tribes of the nation of Israel, starting in chapter 3, verse 11, and going all the way through the end of chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 14. If we were to read these verses consecutively, we would find immediately that they are filled with dramatic descriptions of judgment and condemnations and warnings against the iniquities that Israel had committed. And as we noted last week, the people of Israel were religious, but again, they were not righteous, nor would they prove to be repentant even after God issued this stern warning for their rebellious actions. They were hard-hearted in their hypocrisy, and as a result, God himself stood opposed to them. His His anger 
burned against them. His hatred of their hypocrisy comes out clearly in the message of this book. Now, if you were to do a casual read of chapter 3, verse 11, through chapter 6, verse 14, you might come away overwhelmed by the repeated message of judgment and destruction that is recorded in this section. In fact, you might feel like part of these chapters are redundant, certainly repetitive, and maybe you might feel even a bit random in certain places. But upon closer examination, you would discover that there is actually a brilliant rhetorical structure that lies behind this section, and I want to highlight that structure for you this evening. Amos may have been a shepherd and a farmer, but his literary skill under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is clearly displayed in this section. The structure employed in these chapters is what we would call a chiasm, and it is used frequently throughout the Bible, and we're going to talk a little bit about that so that you understand how this fits and the structure that Amos himself is presenting in this book. A chiasm refers to a rhetorical structure where themes and ideas are repeated like a mirror at the beginning and the end in order to highlight a truth in the middle. Chiasm actually comes from the Greek letter that is often pronounced in English as chi. It looks like an X, and the X itself, the X itself is representative of what a chiasm is. If you start on one side, everything moves to a singular point in the middle before repeating the pattern on the other side. It's the shape of an X that illustrates a chiastic structure, and that's the very structure that Amos employs in this message, this oracle of judgment delivered against Israel. Now, at the risk of making everyone hungry this evening, something that's always dangerous to do when preaching, you might think of a chiasm almost like a sandwich. With a sandwich, you have repeated layers on the top and on the bottom. Maybe the first layer is bread, and then the bottom layer is bread. And then you might add some sort of spread next, I don't know, mayo or mustard. And then you might have a layer of veg, some lettuce and maybe tomatoes or jalapenos. And then a fourth layer might be cheese. And then sandwiched in between all of these layers, you will finally have some sort of meat in the middle. So that if you were to take out a knife and cut that sandwich in two and take a cross section of that sandwich, you would see the layers, the bread, the spread, the veg, the cheese, and then you'd have the meat in the middle, and underneath it, perhaps, you would have those same layers repeated in the opposite order, cheese, veg, spread, and bread. Told you I'd make you hungry. The layers on the bottom of a sandwich, especially certain types of sub-sandwiches, are a mere image of the layers on the top. As you go down through the sandwich, the layers repeat, and yet they exist, those layers do, to complement and to highlight what is in the middle, right? Sandwiches are always named after what is in the middle. If you get some really great roast beef or honey ham in the middle of your sandwich, You don't go around bragging about the fact that you brought a lettuce sandwich to work or a tomato sandwich or a bread sandwich or a cheese sandwich. No, it's a turkey sandwich or a ham sandwich or a roast beef sandwich because the sandwich is named after what's in the middle because what's in the middle is the most important part. And that's true of a chiasm. Chiasm is a literary structure. It's kind of like a rhetorical sandwich. The surrounding layers are not the star of the show. They're there to complement and to point you to what's in the middle. And what's in the middle is the key idea 
It's the central truth, and it's the entire rhetorical point that the author is trying to make. That's the structure that we find here in this oracle of judgment, starting in chapter 3, verse 11, and running all the way through the end of chapter 6. A chiasm, or if you don't like seminary-sounding terms, a sandwich. Well, now that we're all hungry, let's dig into the text. As we study the features of this message of judgment, we will uncover five vivid themes that point to one vital truth. Five vivid themes that point to one vital truth. And again, like the layers of a sandwich, these five themes are articulated in the first half of this portion of Amos and then they are reflected or reiterated or repeated in a mere image fashion in the second half, all of it pointing towards what's in the middle. So let's begin by unpacking these vivid themes one at a time. Now, in order to do this, we're going to actually look at both sides, both layers, the top and the bottom, and we are going to sequentially work our way layer by layer until we end at the meat in the middle. So this is a little bit unorthodox in terms of the way that we would read through a text, but I think it captures the very rhetorical structure that Amos himself is using in this section. So five vivid themes. The first of these themes is that of coming wrath, coming wrath. Like the bread around a sandwich, we find this theme at both the beginning and the end of this diatribe against the Northern Kingdom. We find the beginning of this section in chapter 3, verse 11, and we actually looked at this verse and the verses at the end of chapter 3 last week, but we're going to start there because that's really where Amos begins his oracle of judgment against Israel. The first part of chapter 3, he notes the inevitability of this judgment, and then he calls the nations to serve as witnesses in verses 9 and 10. And then in verse 11, he begins, this is what the Lord God says. Therefore, thus says the Lord, an enemy even one surrounding the land will pull down your strength from you and your citadels will be looted. Thus says the Lord, just as the shepherd snatches from the lion's mouth a couple of legs or the piece of an ear, so will the sons of Israel dwelling in Samaria be snatched away with the corner of a bed and the cover of a couch. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, the God of hosts, for on that day that I punish Israel's transgressions, I will also punish the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and they will fall to the ground. I will also smite the winter house together with the summer house. The house of ivory will also perish and the great houses will come to an end, declares the Lord. Then skip to chapter four, verse two. This wrath continues the Lord God has sworn by his holiness, behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. You will go out through breaches in the walls, each one straight before her, and you will be cast to Harmon, declares the Lord. That is vivid language. But I want you to notice some of the key details in this section because we're going to see those key details repeated at the end. In chapter 3, verse 11, the northern kingdom will be defeated and destroyed by an invading nation. In chapter 3, verse 12, we see a metaphor from the animal kingdom that's used to illustrate the coming judgment. In verse 14, we see God's punishment against Israel's transgressions. In verse 15, the houses of the people will be destroyed. 
In chapter four, verse two, the Lord swears by his holiness that this will happen. And in verses two and three, the women of Samaria, specifically singled out there, are led into exile. These are devastating words of judgment, and they would have no doubt been shocking to the original hearers as they consider this shepherd farmer from Judah who has come into the courts of Samaria to declare judgment. So these shocking words, as I've mentioned, are repeated at the end of this oracle of judgment in keeping with this chiastic sandwich style structure. So look at Amos chapter 6, verses 8 to 14, and you'll see the bottom layer. If chapter 3, verse 11 through chapter 4, verse 3 is the top layer of bread, chapter 6, verses 8 through 11 is the bottom layer in our rhetorical sandwich. And look at what God says there. The Lord God has sworn by himself. The Lord God of hosts has declared, I loathe the arrogance of Jacob and detest his citadels. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all it contains. And it will be if 10 men are left in one house, they will die. Then one's uncle or his undertaker will lift him up to carry out his bones from the house. And he will say to the one who is in the innermost part of the house, is anyone else with you? And that one will say, no one. And then he will answer, keep quiet for the name of the Lord is not to be mentioned. For behold, the Lord is going to command that the great house be smashed to pieces and the small house to fragments. Do horses run on rocks or does one plow them with an ox? Yet you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. You who rejoice in Lodabar and say, have we not by our own strength taken Karmaim for ourselves? For behold, I am going to raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, declares the Lord God of hosts, and they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of the Arabah. Just a few observations about that text before we note some of these parallels with the opening section of this divine oracle. Verse 10, the people who once bragged about their worship of Yahweh are not even wanting to mention his name for fear of his judgment. And then in verse 12, the imagery points to the folly of the corruption of the people of Israel. Here we have a metaphor of like a horse trying to run on slippery rocks or a pair of oxen trying to plow a field of boulders. People's folly is illustrated by their arrogance as verse 13 illustrates. They bragged about conquests, probably conquests made by Jeroboam II, who was the king of Israel at the time, over places, cities, Lodabar and Karmaim. Ironically, Lodabar actually means nothing, and Karmaim means horns, which of course were a symbol of strength in the ancient world. So when they're bragging, they're rejoicing in nothing, and they're finding their strength over the horns of Karmaim in themselves. For all of this in verse 14, God says he's gonna bring a nation, an invading army that's going to destroy the northern kingdom from the northernmost point, Hamath, all the way to the southernmost point, the brook of Arabah. The point then is that the entirety of the northern kingdom is to be destroyed. And you can see very clearly the theme of coming wrath throughout this entire section. But what I wanna point out in keeping with this chiastic structure that I've presented to you is the parallels, the mere image nature of this section at the end of chapter six with what we read in the end of chapter three into the first part of chapter four. You'll notice that in chapter 6, verse 14, there is the promise of judgment through an invading nation, which parallels the promise of judgment through an invading nation in chapter 3, verse 11. 
In chapter six, verse 12, Amos uses a metaphor from the animal kingdom to make his point, something that he also does in chapter three, verse 12. It's also in chapter six, verse 12, that the Lord stands in judgment against Israel's wicked actions, something that he reiterates earlier in chapter three, verse 14, when he executes punishment on Israel for their transgressions. In chapter six, verse 11, we see the destruction of houses, both the small and the great. At the end of chapter three, verse 15, we saw the destruction of houses, winter and summer houses, both the small and the great. In chapter six, verses nine and 10, the men of Israel are slaughtered in their houses. The parallel to that is in chapter four, verses two and three, when the women of Israel are led into captivity with meat hooks and fish hooks. And in chapter six, verse eight, the Lord swears by himself that he will do this. And in chapter four, verse two, he swears by his holiness that he will do this. So the same details are present on both sides of the sandwich which again is the whole point of arranging things as a chiasm is that what you start with, you end with, but the starting and the ending are not the primary point. In many important ways, the end of chapter six provides a mere image of what we saw from chapter three, verse 11 through chapter four, verse three we begin to see then the intentionality with which the prophet Amos put this together. It's in many ways a genius rhetorical device. How could a shepherd and a farmer have done this? But of course he is giving a message which comes from God himself. So the first layer in our sandwich is that of coming wrath. And why is this wrath coming upon Israel? Well, the answer to that question comes in the next two layers in our sandwich. The second layer, the second vivid theme that's expressed in this section is that of complacent wickedness. Complacent wickedness. Why is judgment coming upon Israel? Why is wrath coming upon God's chosen nation? It is because of the complacent wickedness that characterizes the people. Amos already outlined Israel's iniquity in the middle of chapter two. These sins include exploiting their fellow Israelites for their own material gain, which was something that was clearly against God's law. As a result, the leaders in Israel enjoyed lives of excess and luxury, but they had gained those comforts illicitly by extorting the needy, receiving bribes, acting immorally, dealing dishonestly, and taking advantage of their fellow countrymen. And as we discussed last week, the people of Israel had the law of God. They had no excuse. And so they were very familiar with what the New Testament will later call the second great commandment. It's articulated in Leviticus 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Instead of exhibiting love, they acted sinfully in their own self-interest. And so through oppression, cruelty, corruption, bribery, exploitation, and a smug dismissal of God's law, they amassed wealth and built for themselves lives of luxury and comfort. It's important to state In a message like this, that wealth in and of itself is not sinful, but to gain wealth in a dishonest or immoral way is clearly contrary to the law of God. And so as the Lord roars against Israel in judgment, his promises of coming wrath are aimed at the immorality and arrogance of Israel's corruption. Ironically, these 
people were so complacent in their wickedness that they seem completely unaware that judgment awaits them. And then one day, a shepherd farmer from Judah shows up with a message. In keeping with the sandwich structure of this section, the theme of complacent wickedness can be seen both at the beginning and at the end in chapter four and in chapter six. Chapter four, verse one, we skipped over this verse. Amos says, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. Bashan was a region full of lush pastures below Mount Hermon, and so it was a place where cattle would graze. And the analogy here highlights the comfort and abundance of the women of Samaria. It also highlights their complacency because they are completely unaware of pending judgment. Now, to reiterate a point we just made, the root of their evil here, the root of their transgression is not their wealth. It is the immoral means by which they gained such material possessions. Rather than obeying the law with regard to their treatment of their fellow countrymen, their fellow Israelites, instead they oppressed the poor and crushed the needy. But the Lord heard the cries of the distressed and afflicted, and he responded in verses we have already read, verses two and three, the Lord God has sworn by his holiness, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks, and you will go through the breaches in the walls, each one straight before her, and you will be cast to Harmon. The penalty for this complacent wickedness was swift and utter destruction at the hand of the Assyrians. And these prophecies would indeed come to pass roughly three decades after Amos preaches this dire message. The theme of complacency is seen again in chapter 6. As we move from the bottom up, Top down, bottom up, we're moving towards the middle. We see at the first part of Amos chapter six, the parallel passage. This is focused on all of the inhabitants of Samaria. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure in the mountains of Samaria. The distinguished men of the foremost of nations to whom the house of Israel comes Go over to Kalna and look and go from there to Hamath the Great, that's the Syrians, and go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are they better than these kingdoms or is their territory greater than yours? Do you put off the day of calamity? Would you bring near the seat of violence? God there again is invoking the surrounding nations and essentially saying, these nations are headed for judgment and Israel, do you think you're better than them when your sins are equally repugnant to the Lord. But in spite of the danger, verses four to seven, notice the complacency here. Those who recline on beds of ivory and sprawl on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who improvise to the sound of the harp and like David have composed songs for themselves who drink wine from sacrificial bowls, probably a reference to the size of the cups from which they were drinking, while they anoint themselves with the finest of oils, yet they have not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Joseph, there are reference to the northern tribes because the two foremost tribes were Ephraim and Manasseh, who were the two sons of Joseph. Therefore, they will now go into exile at the head of the exiles, and the sprawler's banqueting will pass away. Here they are living it up. In verse 6, they have not grieved over the ruin of Israel. Ruin there, a reference to 
the iniquity, the sin, the wickedness that was being tolerated because that wickedness is what had given them the wealth that they enjoyed. So we see just how complacent Israel was in her wickedness. Rather than feeling the sting of conviction and seeking to repent, Israel is enjoying the fruits of her own iniquity and wants nothing to do with even the thought of repentance. And so God thunders against them. Verse eight, we already read it, but it's a fitting capstone to verses one to seven. The Lord God has sworn by himself. The Lord God of hosts has declared, I loathe the arrogance of Jacob and detest his citadels. And therefore I will deliver up the city of Samaria and all it contains. Well, that brings us then to our third layer in our sandwich. So we've seen a layer of coming wrath and that coming wrath is aimed at complacent wickedness and it is also aimed at counterfeit worship. The third layer in our rhetorical sandwich is counterfeit worship. In spite of their disregard for God's law, which was evidenced in the way that they treated one another, their cruelty toward their fellow Israelites, in spite of all of that, the rich and powerful in Israel still claim to worship the Lord. They claim to worship Yahweh. But God, founds the, God finds their worship to be repulsive, to be unacceptable. It is counterfeit worship because it comes from hearts that are evil. And that evil is demonstrated in the wickedness that characterizes their lives and their normal patterns and routines. To borrow a New Testament scripture, the apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Now, the Apostle John was writing about relationships between believers in the church age, and Amos obviously is writing about relationships between fellow countrymen within the nation of Israel. But the principle is clear. When these people claim to love the Lord, but were simultaneously treating their fellow Israelites with such disregard and malice, the reality of the horizontal relationships evidenced the bankruptcy of whatever they claimed about their vertical relationship to the Lord. And so their claims of praise and worship ring hollow against the backdrop of their wicked lifestyles. The Lord rejects their worship, and you can see this at both the beginning and at the end as again, the third layer in our sandwich, Amos chapter four, verses four and five. The Israelites often worshiped at Bethel and Gilgal. So these are places of worship. Enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a thank offering also from that which is leavened and proclaim free will offerings. Make them known for so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord God. The fact that God is not pleased with their worship is obvious by the fact that he states that when they go to these places of worship, they are actually engaging in transgression. These were places that were special to the nation of Israel. Bethel is the place where Jacob had his famous dream in Genesis 28. Gilgal is where Israel was circumcised before entering to attack Jericho in Joshua chapter five. And the Israelites would go to these places to worship the Lord, to worship Yahweh. And yet the Lord says, I find your worship unacceptable because your lives betray hearts 
that are far from me. This point is amplified when we see the mirror image in Amos chapter 5, verses 21 to 27. This same layer on the other side of the sandwich. Verse 21, God says, I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, and I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps, but let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Did you present me with sacrifices and grain offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O house of Israel? You also carried along Sekuth, your king, and Kayun, your images, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. It's a reference, by the way, to the worship of Molech and the worship of Saturn. Therefore, verse 27, I will make you go into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. God hates their hypocritical worship. And those last three verses are especially interesting because they indicate that even in the wilderness, out of Egypt, the Israelites even then were characterized by duplicitous worship. In fact, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen will he'll quote these verses as an indictment of the religious leaders for their hard-hearted unbelief. And that's Amos's point here as well. Israel, you're characterized by hard-hearted unbelief so that your religion, though on the outside it looks so good, it's repulsive and repugnant to God because he sees the wickedness of your hearts. Well, we're making our way through our sandwich here coming wrath, complacent wickedness, counterfeit worship. There's a fourth layer in our sandwich, and it's the layer of continual warnings, continual warnings. Through the mouth of Amos, the Lord reiterates the repeated warnings he has given to his chosen nation. We see this on the top Half of this oracle in Amos 4, 6 to 13. And look at these repeated warnings, starting with famine, verse 6. I gave you cleanness of teeth. That's not a reference to dental hygiene. That's a reference to not having enough to eat. I gave you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. And yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. And then a second warning through drought. Verse seven, furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there was still three months until harvest. And then I would send rain on one city and on another city, I would not send rain. One part would be rained on while the part not rained on would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water, but would not be satisfied. And yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. And then another warning in the form of Deadly pestilence, devastation on crops. Verse nine, I smote you with scorching wind and mildew and the caterpillar was devouring your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees and yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. And then there was the warning of disease. Verse 10, I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword along with your captured horses, warfare, and I made the the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils, and yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. And the warning, verse 11, of defeat and destruction, I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze, and yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. These are repeated warnings from Israel's history where God's trying to get their attention and yet the response is always the same, they do not repent. Because of this, there's one final warning in verses 12 and 13. It's a warning about the future, a warning characterized by darkness and death. Verse 12, 
Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. You've been warned, now prepare to meet your maker. It is those final words of warning that are reflected on the mirror image side in chapter five, verses 18, 19, and 20, with an emphasis again on darkness and death. Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, that's a reference to when God would show up in judgment and the assumption on the part of Israel was he's coming to judge all of our enemies. Well, those of you who are longing for that day, beware. For what purpose will the day of the Lord be for you? It will be darkness and not light as when a man flees from a lion and a bear meets him or goes home and leans his hand against the wall and a snake bites him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light and gloom with no brightness in it? You've been warned through the past and now there's one final warning. Prepare to meet your God. Chapter four, verse 12. It is the day of the Lord that is coming Chapter five, verse 18, and it is a day of judgment. Well, that brings us to our fifth vivid theme, our fifth layer in this rhetorical sandwich as we've made our way down from the top and up from the bottom. We're getting closer to the middle. Coming wrath from the Lord against Israel's complacent wickedness and counterfeit worship. That wrath is preceded by continual warnings, but the warnings will not last forever. And when that judgment finally comes, it will result in utter collapse and in weeping and mourning. And so in keeping with our outline, I called this collapse and weeping not very clever, but it fit. Collapse and weeping. Chapter five, verses one to three. Hear this word which I take up for you as a dirge, O house of Israel. She has fallen, she will not rise again. The virgin Israel, she has neglect, she lies neglected on her land. There is none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city which goes forth a thousand strong will have a hundred left, and the one which goes forth a hundred strong will have 10 left to the house of Israel. Verse one makes it clear that this is a funeral, a dirge. And the song that's being sung is a song of mourning. She has fallen. Mourning for one like a young maiden came to an untimely end and now there's nothing left but weeping and sadness. Well, this layer is also repeated in keeping with our chiastic structure. Later in chapter five, verses 16 and 17, we again see this theme of collapse and mourning. Therefore, verse five, chapter five, verse 16, therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, the Lord, there is wailing in all the plazas and in all the streets, they say, alas, alas. They also call the farmer to mourning and professional mourners to lamentation. And in all the vineyards, there is wailing because I will pass through the midst of you, says the Lord. And so the result of God's judgment is the utter collapse of Israel and nothing but mourning and sadness and weeping as the effects of the devastation are realized. And who is it that has done this? It is God who has done this and he has done this in his holiness. Holiness. 
Well, Amos has constructed quite a sandwich for us. There's 59 verses in this section, and I think maybe 59 of them are about judgment. But the layers that make up this chiasm, they play a supplemental, complementary, supporting role to one vital truth, and that one vital truth stands in the middle. This is in chapter 5, verse 4 through verse 15. And this is really the climactic point that Amos wants us to take away. It's, again, in keeping with the sandwich metaphor, this is the meat. This is not a judgment sandwich. That's because sandwiches are not named for all of the surrounding layers. They're named for what's in the middle, and what's in the middle is actually a glimmer of hope. It's a call to repentance. It's not a judgment sandwich, it's a repentance sandwich. Let me show you that here in this section in Amos 5, verses 4 to 15. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me that you may live. But do not resort to Bethel and do not come to Gilgal nor cross over to Beersheba for Gilgal will certainly go to captivity and Bethel will come to trouble. Verse six, seek the Lord that you may live or he will break forth like a fire, O house of Joseph, and it will consume with none to quench it for Bethel, for those who turn justice into wormwood and cast righteousness down to the earth. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and changes deep darkness into morning who also darkens day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. It is he who flashes forth with destruction upon the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. Verse 10, speaking of Israel's transgressions, they hate him who reproves in the gates. They abhor him who speaks with integrity. Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor and exact a tribute of grain from them. Though you have built houses of well-hewn stone, yet you will not live in them. You have planned pleasant vineyards, yet you will not drink their wine. For I know your transgressions are many and your sins are great. You who distress the righteous and accept bribes and turn aside the poor in the gate. Therefore, at such a time, the present person or the prudent person, excuse me, keeps silent for it is an evil time. And then verse 14, seek good and not evil that you may live. And thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you just as you have said, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord God of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Now, as we consider this section, remember that Israel was being indicted by God for two primary categories of sin, complacent wickedness and counterfeit worship. This section addresses each of those. In verses four to nine, we have a call to repent from counterfeit worship. Seek me and live, verse four. Seek the Lord and live, verse six. And what is it in contrast to? Their hypocritical worship practices at places like Bethel and Gilgal and Beersheba. And who is the God that they are to seek? Verse eight and nine make it clear that he is the creator of the entire universe, the stars, the seas, and he is also the judge. Abandon your hypocrisy, seek Yahweh, and live. And then in verses 10 to 15, the Lord addresses their complacent wickedness. He reiterates and details the problem in verses 10 to 13, and you can see all of the ways in which they were acting in corruption and exploitation and cruelty and lawlessness. But what is the 
plea, seek good and not evil, that you may live. I mentioned earlier that Amos is 146 verses. I realize verses were added later. Amos didn't put verse numbers when he wrote his prophecy, but they do give you some indication of the length of a book and its content. In keeping with that chiastic idea, if you were to find the middle two verses of the, ver- of the book of Amos, it would be Amos chapter five. Uh, yeah, it would be Amos chapter five, verses 14 and 15. It is these verses. I think that's amazing. This is a call to repentance. This is a call to turn from your false worship and turn from your corrupt lifestyle. Turn to God, the one who stands against you. Turn to him and you will find mercy and you will have life. These are words of hope surrounded by words of judgment. This is the central message of this section. Like a diamond in the darkness, it gleams. It is the vital truth surrounded by the vivid themes of judgment. If they seek the Lord and walk in his ways, he will relent and they will be saved. Now, of course, we know from history that Israel did not repent. And God did send the Assyrians roughly, again, three decades after this prophecy was delivered. And just as God forewarned, Israel was destroyed, most of the people were killed, and those who survived were taken into captivity. But I think it's interesting, as we mentioned earlier, that Amos was a contemporary of Jonah, and he was also a contemporary of Isaiah, And Jonah, some years earlier, had preached a similar message against Nineveh, and Nineveh did repent, and God did relent. And Isaiah preached a similar message against Judah some years after Amos, and Judah under King Hezekiah did respond in repentance. And when the Assyrians came, the same Assyrians that conquered Israel God miraculously spared Judah because of Hezekiah's repentance. And you can read about that in 2 Kings 18 and 19. But as for Israel, they missed the warning and they would experience God's wrath. Well, we've covered a significant portion of verses this evening. I hope the structure of the sandwich was clear Five vivid themes, God's coming wrath, enraged against the complacent wickedness and counterfeit worship of the people, his wrath preceded by continual warnings, but once the hammer of judgment fell, nothing but utter collapse and weeping. And yet in the middle of this oracle of judgment, we find a message of hope and a message of salvation If Israel was to be spared, they must turn from their sin and turn to the Lord. So what are the implications for us today? We're not living in the 8th century BC in the northern kingdom. We don't face the threat of Assyrian invasion. But when we look at this text... Although it was delivered in a specific historical context to the nation of Israel, the principles that we find here are as relevant for us today as they were for Amos. What we see in this text is that God is holy and that God's wrath burns against those who live in unrepentant sin. There are many in our world who are characterized by complacent wickedness And they may be religious, but their religion is counterfeit because their hearts are far from God. And all throughout human history, and all throughout his word, God gives continual warnings 
for those who do not heed those warnings, there is future judgment to face. Everything they hold dear will one day collapse. And when they stand before God, there will be nothing but weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is every sinner's reality. Judgment is coming. Judgment on your wickedness with no future but eternal ruin. And the question you must ask yourself is, is there any hope? And the message of, An of Amos answers resoundingly, yes. But only if you turn to the Lord, embrace him in true worship, follow his word, submit to him in a repentant faith, seek him and you will live. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word from almost three millennia ago, nearly 800 years before Christ. And yet these principles ring out so clearly of judgment on sin and salvation available only through you. If there's anyone here this evening who does not know you, my prayer for them is that they would cry out to you for mercy, that they would seek the Lord and live. For it is only in you that we have any hope and you have graciously provided a way of escape through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that all who put their faith in him will not be disappointed, they will not perish, they will have eternal life. And we pray these things in his name, amen.